thank you so much for coming. This is one of the first of many events we're going to have like this, and we've deliberately set it up so it's a really intimate setting, amazing speakers uh, that we bring along, and we want this to be a really engaging conversation amongst the panel. And then I'll open it up to, to have uh, questions and answers and, and more interaction with the audience. But initially, it's going to be a lot of interaction amongst the panel, because I do think that's the way we can get a real value out of the incredible, talented minds that we have before us today. Uh, so just to firstly say uh, welcome on behalf of E.H. Smith Solutions and Paul, who's standing very gracefully at the back there. Uh, now, I've known Paul for, well, more than a decade now. And uh, we first began working uh, with each other when I was specifying and uh, selecting bricks for Reading Station. And, but you became so much more than, than a brick supplier. You were part of the team. And it really is those connections and the building the, the relationships you build with your, your core team, but also um, the suppliers and your external consultants is so valuable in our industry. And I really think that this is what these events uh, will be about in the future. It's about building connections, building relationships, and really learning some valuable insights, things that might not be discussed um, normally out there or in this sort of forum. Uh, so in terms of um, introducing myself, my name is Tanya Elenfeld. I, I'm an architect, an author, and I'm here tonight as editorial director for Disrupt magazine. And it is a platform where we are wanting to have really impactful conversations and we can draw together the minds of, of people like uh, what, what we have today. And we really want this to be um, something that changes the industry, changes the conversations, has a real meaningful uh, impact in terms of breaking down silos and talking about things that other people aren't talking about and giving a platform to, to the voices that aren't typically heard. So that's the mission behind Disrupt. And we want to host events like this. So it, I, Alison Brooks needs no introduction, but I will introduce Alison, um, uh, obviously one of the most acclaimed architects here in the UK. You're a founder, you're brave enough to have your own practice, and we are going to be discussing w the way in which you design and how you bring others with you and what you'd like to see change in the industry. And I'm really looking forward to that. We have Jane Clay, St Strategic Director at Gensler. Now, you, we've had an amazing conversation before, and I'm just in awe of the way in which you approach your, your role and the clients that you work with, uh, like clients like Google, um, and the strategy that you apply to, to your design work. So there's, it, it will be a fascinating conversation, I'm sure. And then Alice Deitch from ALA. Now, ALA is one of the most experimental, innovative practices in the UK. So I cannot wait to hear your perspective on things. We're actually meeting for the first time today. Um, but I know, I know of your work. And of, of course, you were working on the V&A Museum. Uh, so we can't wait to hear more about that as well. So I want this to be quite a free-flowing conversation um, and very relaxed and a little bit of riffing as, as, as the panel have discussed. So I think that's, that's the way it will go. And then there will be questions at the end. So please hold your questions for the end. So Alison, if I could start with you in terms of, you know, I, I'm really interested in those brave moments. I mean, you've had an amazing career. But already starting your own business is a brave moment. But I would love to hear about something, a pivotal moment in your career where you were braver than you thought you could be and you know, what happened next, basically. Well, um, thank you for the introduction, Tanya, um, and for this event, which is great. It's, it's funny, I, there are so many moments and some of them I look back on and cringe. Like, uh, they're kind of funny stories like, um, I think it was in 2001, somehow I got an invitation to present to Dickin Robinson, who was CEO of the Peabody Trust, Peabody Housing Group. And I just had my second child and who was only, or maybe it was the first one. Sorry, it's a bit of kids. A <laughs> Can't remember. <laughs> Maybe it must have been the first one because the, it, the meeting came and he was only like a week old or something. And I thought, I have to go to this interview. I, you know, you don't ever get these invitations to meet with CEOs of housing groups. And I was so terrified that 
this new baby would start to cry or do something un unforeseen that I took him into the meeting <laughs> with Dick and Robinson in the sort of chair, you know, those chairs with the handle. And I, I walked in and Dickon was sitting there behind the desk and I didn't know what to do with, you know, Dylan. <laughs> and so I sort of pushed him under Dickon's <laughs> desk. <laughs> and, and then we had the meeting and the conversation and amazingly, you know, he didn't cry, but I just thought, what, why would I do that? Why would I not like uh, leave him outside? the baby with, you know, somebody else, <laughs> no, just anybody, and not bring him into the interview. So anyway, um, anyway, I did that. And I mean, I didn't get a, a project, but um, I can't believe I was brave enough to bring sort of a brand new baby into interview with a client. I'm sure it was not, a memorable really thing. interview for this person. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Um, but I think in terms of pivotal moments, when you finish your first project and you think, okay, I have to, I'm in the wilderness, nobody knows or heard, has heard of me, and I have to get out there somehow, and there was no internet, and there was no nothing back then, and I submitted my first project for an RBA award, and, and that was when you had to physically submit photographs that were signed by the photographer on the back to prove that it was an authentic photograph, and... Um, I was five minutes late for the deadline on the day and I sort of raced up to the RBA and the big bronze doors at the front oh. were closing oh. and I was sort of running up the step, the ramp with my, um, you know, envelope of, of my project and, and then I sort of buzzed on the doorbell and the, you know, the, the security guard came out and he took my, he took my envelope with my VXO house in Hampstead and that project won an RBA award and it was published all over the place and if the RBA hadn't sort of opened the door <laughs> after <laughs> after the closing time I don't know probably my whole career might have taken a lot longer to I don't know take off or just sort of be known at all so that was yeah a kind of nice combination of an institution and a sort of benign um attitude towards just being a little bit late but um yeah it's it was a great free exposure sort of marketing to get an RBA award for a project and if you hadn't run quite so fast and the doors had already closed you'd yeah. have been or if i'd driven a little bit faster <laughs> down portland place but um yeah that was those are those are very early early stories and Jane, can I ask a similar question of you in terms of a pivotal moment? I mean, you're obviously working in a very large organization now, but in terms yeah. of the, the twists and turns in your career that's led you to where you are now? Again, you know, it's like an early 40-year career. There's so many, but I think, that, I think the decision to move out of interiors to strategy was one, partly because I just had an interest in understanding what went on in people's heads. So actually being able to have the conversations and then dig deep into why people want to do things a certain way. That was one kind of brave move because strategy wasn't really a thing back then. Um, so kind of getting into the beginnings of that, particularly at a company called DGW, if anybody knows what that was, if you don't look it up. Um, so that was really the kind of place where strategy or consulting thinking took off here, I guess. Um, and that was a bit of a brave move because people weren't really doing it. But that was one. But then there are many others. I mean, I can think of one um, at Gensler where, you know, we had an account, a strategic account with a big tech client. And uh, we were doing loads of strategy work with them along, you know, seven different work streams. But and we knew them really well. And we'd been working with them for about four years. And I kept wanting to get a design job you know it was great doing the strategy and I was leading the account that was fantastic but I was like we really need a design job I want to pass a design job and lob it over to the interiors team this is what we really want to do this would be it you know we pitched for about three and we lost every one and we were in prime position we should have won them because we knew them we knew them inside out we'd actually done the strategy for many of them mm -hmm. And it was infuriating to me. Why weren't our interiors teams getting it? Why couldn't we translate? Why wasn't there this integration? Why wasn't there an understanding of what we knew? Um, and in the end, I thought, scratch that. 
solid. Let's just think again. Let's just start from scratch. And we did get a final chance and it was the project in Dublin. And um, my client was very understanding. He said, I'm going to give you a last chance. If you don't get this one, you're screwed, <laughs> basically. And that was fine. We knew what we were up against. And um, we knew we had to think very differently. So profiling who's going to work on a project is pretty key, especially if you know your client very well. Think about who you're going to put on that project, who matches. It's like speed dating, right? It's like Tinder for clients and, and designers, right? Think about who will click. Um, think about who has the outside of the box ideas. And that might be the person who actually is hard to resource on other projects sometimes. This might be their moment. So actually there was one colleague who, her real background in a way, her ethos and, and the way she worked was all about storytelling. And in a way, an experiential thinker without kind of professing that that's what she was. Do you know what I mean? She, she was driven by her client's why. She always thought about the brand, the experience, the kind of holistic view of everything. And she used to talk about smell in design and senses and sound and that, you know, the 360 aspect of design. And, you know, for many in Gensler, particularly at that time, that was a bit, ooh, bit, bit, it's a bit out there. Um, and for many of our clients, but actually for this client, she seemed like a good match. And I got her to meet the client and the client said, yeah, I think we could get on with her. So that was, that was good. Tinder date was good. Um, and then um, we started to think about how we could approach the project. And of course, it was a project in Dublin. It was very rooted. It was the EU hub for that client. Um, it was very rooted, known history in Dublin. Um, and so we started to think about Dublin as a place, as a landscape. And that led to the idea of, you know, the landscape of Dublin. And actually, we had a moment where we were crowdsourcing with the young designers. And that's the other thing. Don't forget the younger teams because, you know, quite often at pitches, they don't get involved. And you think you have to have the, the best people and the people who know how to do things and actually, you know, use the young people because they have different ideas. They don't, they're not, they're not, they're not blocked by preconceived ideas. They just throw stuff out and you think, God, that's a good idea. Why didn't I think of that? You know, and it's great. You know, so we did a lot of crowdsourcing and Amanda and I were sitting there after one session and we thought to ourselves, you know, we've got a picture of this landscape of Dublin and it was fields and connection points. And somebody had said, you know, when you have a crossroads, people often get together and there are platforms, little wooden platforms where people dance. Some weird kind of Irish thing and um, historical somehow. And we started to weird and wonderful at the same time. right? Weird and wonderful. But it was, uh, you know, cultural, culturally relevant and specific. Um, and historical, really rooted in itself. And we were like, do you know what? It's like, let's look at the building floor plan. And the building floor plan was a bit funky. We were working with an architect in Dublin, great architect, fantastic partner. And um, we kind of went, we just put those two together. And we were like, oh, wow. You know, you just overlaid one and the other. And that, and that led to the idea, we got our, one of our landscape architects to just draw the floor plan as a landscape plan, literally a landscape plan. And it was fields and trees and glades and paths and desire lines. And that's what we pitched. And that's what won us the pitch. It wasn't a design or a floor plan. I mean, there was other bits to it, but the client actually said that was the happy plan. That was the plan that was sold. I mean, that was a real risk. And it's not so much a brave decision as I would say it's when is a risk, not a risk, because you're kind of in a situation where, do you know what, I might as well do this. <coughs> It sounded like you were in a situation where this was the last, this was the last gasp. So you could yeah. just throw something at this because there was no other option. But the fact that you'd built the relationship with, um, with the client as part of this strategy work that you had done yeah. laid the foundation then to, yeah. to really go but in and do this design. Within that, and I think don't forget sometimes in those moments when you think all else has failed, there is a freedom. And I think sometimes we forget that there is a bit of joy in those moments, that you get a freedom because all's not lost. It actually frees the creative mind sometimes to say, what if I did something completely different for, for us? It, you know, that yeah. might not be different for any of you. I'm not saying ours was the best idea. I'm just saying that sometimes you can take a risk because it's not actually a risk. And those moments don't 
come very often because I'm sure you're all very successful. Um, but sometimes they're an absolute pure joy and you get what you want from it. And you know, that, those can be the most satisfying moments. So there was victory in the end. That was good. <laughs> So Alice, are you thinking along um, the lines of a pivotal moment in your career that you've just were brave out of your skin? You thought, I, I wouldn't normally do this, but under these circumstances, I'm seeing something. I want this opportunity or... The answer is no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't function like that. I find, you know, I, I glimpsed at your question before I came, said, I said, this is what the topic would be about. And I'm like, brave, oh God, <laughs> I feel I've been brave every day of the week this week, you know, it's just I see it as <laughs> such a, brave. such a, yeah. I don't know, it's such a tough job, such a relentless, thing. I don't know, it's maybe because it was a crazy month where a lot of deadline, lots of competition, where every day you have to sort of pile up again and think, uh, you know, put something else again, lose or win, but lose more than you win usually. And to me, being brave is, is taking all those, those moments that are not the fun part, that are not, not the, the, the eureka moment, which are just joy. It's not brave, right? The mm -hmm. uh, eureka moment. So, or the, the moment where you really enjoy uh, designing and producing. To, to me, brave, I mean, being brave is, is more keep, keep, keep on going, if you want, you know, going back at it, losing something and still feeling very positive about the work you've done. Um, uh, and then I, I, I mean, I don't know, I think you, we wanted to have a sort of a, a story or, or, um, or something like that, which I don't really have, but I can see that other people have been brave towards me, uh, leaving me space. Uh, you know, you told you, uh, you wanted to hear some story about the Vienna. Uh, of course, when we won the competition, I, we went to the in interview, Amanda and I, and with the guys from Arab, and I was uh, foreign, uh, quite inexperienced, and we go to the interview and, um, and we win. And then at that point, I'm like, oh, they, they are pretty brave to, uh, to, you know. And then I went on to lead the project. <laughs> No, but I mean, the, the practice was not uh, known in the same way. Amanda had just re restarted as ALA um, with us. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I was young and foreign. And both the VNA and Amanda trusted me to then take over the project uh, and, and lead the job. And I, I feel those moments are, you know, when the clients are brave enough to, <laughs> to take you on. We could all do with some braver clients, couldn't we? Let's just, <laughs> let's just acknowledge that, yes. But also to put things into context, you actually lead the competition teams within ALA. So yeah, you're, you're so in this constant, relentless it's, it's pursuit it's of bravery and there's risk involved. Yeah. There's, there's a chance, there's a strong chance you won't win, yeah. but you have to keep going anyway. And you have to keep believing in what you do and yeah. keeping believing that this was a really good proposal. It was just not a match, as you yeah. described. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it was just like just not, a good, not a good match this not time. Personal. Not personal. Nothing personal, uh, <laughs> but they were maybe not brave enough to pick you. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, you know, the first time I met Amanda, we were working on News International yeah. and I was at per uh, Pringle Brandon then. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> that was the first time I met Amanda and I couldn't believe how tiny she was. <laughs> and she walked in in these incredible kind of heels and she had this, I mean, her presence was incredible. And this guy walked in the room, Murdoch Jr., I can't even remember what his name was. And I was like, I don't know, who's he? I didn't know. And he was like, hello, expecting me to fall over backwards. I was like, hi, thinking, is he going to do the tea? I don't know what was going on. <laughs> so funny. And Amanda's presence is something she, else. She's, there, she's, yeah, she's amazing. There. So in terms of, okay, we, we could all do with braver clients, but assuming you've got a brave client and you're on the pursuit of a particular design idea, how do you, how do you bring your team with you? Um, and... And, and the wider stakeholder and consultant team. I, I think we would all love to, to hear stories about tips and tricks here, right? Well, I think we, I mean, we tend to win our work through competitions. So it's, you know, every time you do a competition, you, yes, you have to be brave and you have yeah. to put everything on the line. And we do, um, make it a very open process. I think now the 
the principle of sort of testing and hive mind and you know using the whole team and enabling everybody to come forward with strategies and ideas and sharing them discussing them and then selecting is you know it's quite an open process and we you know you just need to do that i think the mm -hmm. the sort of myth of like mm -hmm. oh here's my sketch you know here's the competition Go forth and make it happen. that <laughs> that is not a reality in the yeah. contemporary world and that's world. not what's bringing people together and it's I not say. what's bringing yeah. people together yeah. so so we um and i try to make it very open of course at a certain moment somebody has to decide or you merge merge uh, mm. proposals together or you sort of think all of these things aren't working and it triggers something else and but there's a lot of testing there's a lot of um, iter iterations and testing but I think one of the most important things is also to sort of think that you've arrived at something and then just say let's let's do the opposite of that you know, what, what are we not seeing? Let's turn what we've done completely inside out and, you know, test the opposite idea. And so it creates a, a kind of dialogue, a conversation with everyone in the... Because also if you try the opposite or test it, at least it might just validate the original Exactly. You need, to, you need to know also what the critique will be of, of your proposal. So it's good to try to preempt yeah, all those, so right. all those critiques. It's really important. <laughs> it, because yeah. some, everything you do, if you flip it, you can see what a counter argument or a counter view is. And actually sometimes in the flip, you find something you new. You find something new. Yeah. But, but even, even preceding that, we do, I think like many architects, we do a lot of research before yeah. we actually start designing. We try to under, you know, always go to wherever the project is in the site, try to get under the skin, try to, of the place and the people and the culture and, um, Yes, do a kind of, I call it a sort of investigative journalism. You know, we, we go out as spies and try to find the clues and investigate. And, um, but then also try to get into this sort of spirit of the place. So it's about also dreaming or trying to imagine what are the client's dreams and what kind of um, places or the, or, or the community you know what is their dream as a as a as an identity or as a as a place that actually serves them in their everyday life so yeah it's a kind of combination of research fact finding and and sort of dream thinking but also being very critical because everything has to be everything has to answer the why you know why this decision why why not that and analysis and sort of clarity at the end of the day you have to be very clear about what the what the idea is that sort of underpins the scheme mm -hmm. and sometimes you know that that idea resonates and sometimes it's it's very dependent on um, the jury the client the the kind of um, ambition of of who's yeah I think the, on the other side. what you talk about the projects why or you know the clients why I think that's really important because that's kind of when you have that kind of north star that you know that is the thing that you'll filter things through I mean that doesn't mean to say it might not morph a little um, but if you've read and understood what the RFP or the ask is, um, I think you can always go back to that and then people have a direction. I mean, that doesn't mean to say you can't interpret it in different ways, um, but I think having alignment and being clear about the, the testing of that against that is important. I, you know, I think historically I've seen so many over the years and, and in my career, so many people just go straight to the design without questioning or without understanding that real why. And that's where you miss the trick. And I think what you're saying is so important that, that the iterative element of it has to respond back to the bigger why. It's really, really critical, yeah. Do you think the, the difference with um, entering into a design competition is that there is a brief and there is an ambition, there is a dream that's 
basically laid out by the client. Whereas in other projects, it's like drawing teeth from the client in terms of trying to understand their ambition, trying to understand their dream, trying to understand what it is that they want. Do you, I'd love to your reaction. I think there's probably always a little bit of that, yeah, but yeah. then the, uh, I mean, the question is how, you know, the competition is just a short moment in a project compared to how you then take it on for five years, 10 years, you know, those really long time span and how you, because, I mean, you're trying to talk about the, um, how do you bring people together? How do you keep the, uh, the probably the excitement that was there at the competition, both from, from the client and from the, the design team? And, and I think what you're talking to, uh, Alison, on, on trying to, if everyone has been part of that research and everyone has been part of the journey from the beginning and it feels like it's there. Uh, it's everybody's um, uh, piece of work, it's everybody's um, journey, then that makes it uh, something that just embark everyone, I think, uh, on, 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 a on a journey that can be, you know, much longer uh, and, and um, turbulent. Um, and so, Alison, when you're describing this, is this within your internal team or do you open this up to your um, consultants and a wider group? It's interesting. I mean, now we often, I'm mainly talking about the internal team, but it, because also with a lot of competitions, you have to sign NDAs and you can't include the community or yeah. the client yeah. or anybody. You, yeah. you have to kind of work in isolation, but with your client team. And now... Very often we set up a Miro board. Everybody, I'm sure, set, sets up Miro boards and puts the whole process up there, the research, the brief, the iterations, the everything, and we share it with our consultants. But often they kind of hold back. <laughs> they, they kind of hold back till the very end because they know that we will do, you know, 30 times <laughs> as much work as, you know, they've got time to dedicate to something like a competition or a bid but we you know we have weekly meetings or bi-weekly meetings and try to get feedback try to pull in the the knowledge of our consultant teams and when it's when it's sort of more okay we've won and now we need to consult with the users and the communities who, who will use our building I mean then it's much more about just being a really good listener and making sure that the whole process of consultation is is transparent and it's properly recorded mm -hmm. and it's shared and um, yeah there's a there's an interesting thing where a lot of clients say they sort of want to be led um, by their professional expert consultants but on the other hand there's a instinct to want to listen and respond and you know satisfy the needs and co-create to a certain extent but often that's not fully aligned between sort of the, the um, you know, sponsors of the project or the, the client and, and then the, you know, our instinct to want to be more inclusive with, with the people who will be using the building. So we're, we're juggling. We always have to kind of balance I these totally needs. Agree. I mean, that's one thing. I mean, you're sort of one of those questions was around that, I think, where where things can kind of go a bit tits up is when you get that misalignment. You know, if you've got a project sponsor who's saying, well, you know, hey, we're all free address and, you know, the whole design is based on this ethos and, you know, this is our mission and we're going to be this in the future. And then they're demanding an office um, on a window which completely disrupts the design and they won't budge, mm -hmm. then they're not leading by the example. I mean, that's an extreme case, but yes, that happened. You know, it, it's a... It's a misalignment. I mean, that's a kind of basic example of one. But, you know, the aspiration from the perspective is to listen, to have more interaction, to have more engagement with the users of the building, because you want to understand their experience and the experience that they want, not now, not five years hence, but you also want to ask about the experience they want 10 years hence. Because quite often the people that you're having some of the direction from at the client level are not necessarily the people who are going to be in the building in 10 or 20 years. So, you know, that's something you have to navigate as well as asking the right questions and listening to the right people and making sure that you include that in the response that you make. And that, that's a bit of diplomacy. I think we have to play quite a lot. 
Yeah, it's reading the room, it's understanding yeah. the dynamics and who's actually within the client organization actually making the decisions and not maybe a front for making decisions yeah. and things like that. Yeah, I'd love to know if there was, if you're willing to share, if there was a particular um, challenge in the V&A project that was like a real, like just something that just couldn't budge for, for such a long time and then you found your way through. Oh yeah, tons. Yeah, yeah, there was, there was uh, quite a few of those moments, but the, uh, I think maybe the one which is interesting to talk about is the, um, the, the courtyard tiles, which were um, so, uh, which were the result of a collaboration where everyone had to be on board from us, the, the design team, the client team, um, the manufacturers. And, and so we knew we wanted to do something special with the, the porcelain tiles, but to, to sort of speak of the ethos of the v and 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 what the v and is about and the arts and crafts and, and so on and the collection of ceramics. You know, we had all those sort of uh, ideas uh, and then we <coughs> came to the to a board meeting at the v and and explained to them that we wanted to do a porcelain floor and they all just panicked a bit because the, just the word porcelain feels like it's just going to break. So we, we uh, persuaded them to, uh, to come with us on that journey to try to define, I mean, to design a product which didn't exist and to do that piece of research to uh, go and see manufacturers. We went to, uh, um, we went to the pottery in uh, north of England. We went to Limoges in France. We went to uh, the Netherlands to try to learn uh, all of us um, about uh, building in, in person and, and how we could do a, a floor tile. And, and so, I mean, that was really an example where you had to, through, um, through the narrative, through the, uh, the joy of experimenting, through the joy of doing something new, uh, where we had to sort of bring everyone on board and not really knowing where this was going to um, mm. get us to. And we ended up, you know, having a, a wonderful journey of learning with the, the ceramic manufacturers that were in the Netherlands. Um, uh, the oldest uh, royal manufacturer uh, there. They, they used to make little figurines uh, of in porcelain, and, and then they were starting to do a switch to try to do um, tile floor and, and move to the architectural scale. So this project was sort of um, a support for that. So I mean, all of this was so exciting as not only a, um, a product but as a journey. Uh, um, yeah, that was so relevant to what we were. To, to the v as a client and, and to us as a practice because we love researching and they they were completely on board. In I'm sure when the contractors got on board, they said, you're, you're designing what? You're, you're creating what from scratch? <laughs> in what factory <laughs> that has never done this before? <laughs> um, but I guess, you know, you had the v behind you. You had the scale of that project where you yeah. could actually create a new material for that project. Yeah, yeah. And there, there was uh, other examples, you know, I mean, we are kind of surrounded with, with samples of ceramic tiles here on, the, on this space and, and, uh, and we had uh, started to work on mat where uh, there's, there is a ceramic facade. So it was just trying to sort of get to, a, to the same family of product, but, but doing something uh, special for, for, the, for the museum there. So, yeah. And do you know that they've gone on to use these tiles now in other interesting projects? Or well, Tischler has gone on to continue to do, to do um, ceramics in architecture, yeah. Um, but so yeah. you should have got a patent and or they, something on there, right? <laughs> there should be some, some royalties. Well, that, we did so some yeah. crazy tests. We did the, the sleep test, uh, which is a, a foot just like, uh, you know, uh, walking on a tide for I don't know how many cycles and, and things like that. But I mean, it, it was not about getting a patent or anything. It was just hard enough to just uh, get to the finish but line. Potential future opportunity, get yeah. a patent in place, <laughs> all the royalties cut <laughs> flowing in. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> as long as the tile was right and it the worked. The tile is right. But given just to, to, to finish on that thing of how you bring people with you and you, given that you are in a competitions team and you're trying to motivate your team constantly to, okay, that we, didn't, we weren't successful on that project, yeah. let's regain our energy, let's start fresh and apply over here on this, this brand new, fresh, shiny thing. Yeah, I think how do you I how think do you, you do don't that? start fresh completely. I think you mm. you always, I mean, I don't know, I think the the two things that you need to have to bring a team on board every time is uh, believing in what they do. So, you know, you don't start fresh. What we've done before was perfectly 
good and it just didn't work, didn't match, you know, but yeah. those ideas can be uh, thought about again in another situation. So you, that's just something that continues and, uh, and everyone is part of it. And then it has to be about having fun and having, you know, the, just the pleasure to, uh, to work together. So I don't know, I, I hope I'm a, I'm, <laughs> I'm a fun person to work with. In the office. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask them later, we'll ask them later. <laughs> There's a few of you here, right? <laughs> I think it's part, it's part of that, yes, to make sure that you, you enjoy what you're doing. Uh, and, um, yeah, and, uh, but what, and what personally inspires you to, to start a design? A narrative and uh, a story. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's always a story. Yeah. And, um, yeah, was, you know, the V&A was as much about discovering this, I mean, understanding the site and, and so on, and the potential of the site and the opportunity and what the budget allows and, and so on and so on. But also, what is the story? I mean, I'm, I really, I, that's, that's what I, that turns me on really, the, just the story that comes with the, the project. So now I want to move on to this real thing, that this, this thing you want to change in our industry. If, there was, if you could just change something tomorrow and for it to have an influence over the, next, over the coming, say, five years, you know, what is that thing that you would most love to see change and, and why is that important to you? I would like to see strategy embedded on every project. Now, I think for some people, strategy is embedded. But, you know, if we think about the traditional RIBA process and stage zero, you know, in my experience, I have found quite often that that stage is skipped a little bit or shortened because people want to get to the design. But actually, if strategy is done right, you understand the story, you take time to understand the joy of the story, you really interrogate that story, you really listen to the client's story. Back to many of the topics we've talked about, you understand their why and the purpose, what's driven them to this, to want this. Um, and you can start to get your own joy out of that. And then you talk about, well, how do you want to manifest that? Um, and you spend time, it's not just one vision session, it's many right and it's co-creation in that sense it's a partnership and extending that period um, and i think that's something that we don't as designers do enough um, i think some may do and don't shoot me if i'm saying <laughs> something you already do but you know in my experience that's been something that's been short-circuited because if that's done right i think then you have a blueprint for the design and you can kind of keep the design you know spending that time up front isn't uh, an expense that you don't need to spend it isn't you know it's how do you integrate that in the right way and you can have the conversations about regeneration and sustainability and all the things we need to be talking about and so I think maybe maybe it's about not thinking about the RIBA process which clients always hook on to and just thinking about the process that we all need to undertake and how we want to do it. You know, let's flip that on its head, back to the word flip, you know, let's just do what we need to do. And you can put the, you can put the RIBA layers on it afterwards because it'll fit, right? But spend the time, I think, to have that deep dive and that interrogation. And, and so really when you say strategy, that. do you mean vision or do you mean I think a plan it's, around it's, the vision. it's about vision and it's about the plan around the vision. So I think, you know, there's two levels of strategy. You can have a very high level vision, which is, hey, what's my kind of guardrails around this vision? I've interpreted their vision. They say, God, you've got us. You know, you've got it. You've got it. This is us. Right. This is what we want. So you've interpreted what they want um, and they're happy. You know, and then you have to kind of start to make that more granular and more real for them to the point where an architect or a designer can pick it up. Can latch onto something yeah. rather than And I mean, you're just making somebody yeah. else's life easier. That doesn't mean to say you're prescribing what follows. You're just saying, if I'm bringing that to life, I'm just giving it some credence, right? I'm just giving it a little bit more robustness. Now, that any designer who does design well is able to do that but sometimes we box things too much and we don't integrate them and also do you think makes do you think clients have enough of the um do they know how to articulate strategy and vision 
or it is, is it a matter of having to draw it out of them, do you think, in your well, experience? I think we said it earlier. I mean, it's about conversation, and you were talking about it, about, you know, you have to listen. Um, but I think you have to also um, be prepared to tease out. And, I, you know, that's a lot about asking the right questions as well. And you know, it doesn't matter if you ask questions that they might think, why are you asking that question? I mean, if you get the end result, you know, I think you have to be prepared to ask questions that it doesn't matter if... <laughs> I'm not going to, it won't sound right. It doesn't matter if you, if you look stupid. That's not going to sound right, but you know what I mean? I mean, it's like be prepared be to brave. be brave and be prepared to ask a question that needs asking, right? Because if you're not clear as somebody with experience, then everybody else in the room isn't clear, right? So I think you have to be prepared to get to the nub of things um, and you have to be prepared to ask those questions and constantly be curious so if somebody's saying well I want it this way and you have to go well why is that so important and what's that driven by and is that because and you know sometimes you get down to the root of it and it actually doesn't mean anything or it means something more substantial than you ever thought it did so I think time spent in those conversations and in that dialogue and in really listening and understanding what's below the radar of the RFP or you know, whatever the brief might have been is extremely important. And, so, you know, for me, there's kind of two levels. There's, there's more levels of strategy than we think there are, if that all makes sense. It does. So not biased at all, but you would like to see I would more like to strategy see in place. Because I guess strategy. this helps decision making at every stage. Yeah. And but but it does require a certain sophistication at the client level, I would say. It does. But I think that, you know, if if you're asking the right questions and you can get them interested and you can show them that you are curious and you have, to your word, a joy in and a real interest in their story, then they're in. You know, you, you kind of have a hook that they're already there, I yes. think. I would quite like if the, um, if for for frame of action, if you want, would be broader. And maybe that's a little bit down to strategy, you know, how, how the work we do could reach, uh, could reach more audience, mm. uh, how you could um, also work on a business park and also work on a supermarket and, and on, a, on those things that, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe don't always get the same attention that the the, the project that, I mean, we particularly do at, at ALA and, and how you can, um, how the, the built environment can benefit from the, the, the research that architects yeah. do and bring to, and the conversation that architects bring to the, uh, to the table to, to a broader feel of. Uh, and I don't really know how you do this. Uh, I guess it's about how things are commissioned a little bit and, and, uh, and where the money is, but um, and and maybe empowering more councils or more local authorities so they can be deciding m more. Uh, I mean that the public can be deciding mm. more on what's going on around us in in in, in the built production, if you want. Yeah. So uh, that that would be the thing I would quite like to change. So that all the conversation, all the good conversation we're having, whether it's about uh, social social change or sustainability, obviously, or just doing good design can be can reach to to more projects or more yeah, more more spaces you know I'm speaking more not really as an architect more as a sort of user of of spaces I would quite like to see so if there was a client that came to you tomorrow with a supermarket mm -hmm. Would you I'd go? Take, yeah, 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 you yeah. Take it. Yeah, say, yeah, 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 I want yeah, this. Yes, yes. But you see that in other places. I mean, you yeah. go to Austria. They are amazing. Yeah. They have amazing supermarkets. You know, and that really contribute to uh, to. Uh, I mean, I'm just gonna. Yeah, I don't know if they're amazing, but you know, there's an effort that there's is put in everything. Yes. And there's some yeah. culture. You go to. Uh, you go to Finland or Japan or I mean, and it's not reserved to. Um, um, you know, a uh, wealthy country or, or anything like that. It's it's more that I think there's uh, yeah there's. It, there's a bigger reach. And they occupy really large sites and people are using them every day. Yes, exactly. So, so the impact is probably somewhat yes. greater than doing a museum, which is sort of uh, not, not well, necessarily... Well, it's an experience, isn't it? Right. And it's a community experience. Everybody at all levels might experience that space. So that's actually really intriguing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so how would architects get more involved no, in I'm these not things? Too because sure. we're not going to lower our fees no. because they're already low <laughs> enough. <laughs> I don't know, I listen to you, Beyonce. <laughs> there are so many things. 
that I would want to change in the industry. I mean, so many things. I mean, even starting with education, I yeah. think design and the design of the environment and the interrelationship of the built environment, nature, infrastructure, systems, you know, yeah. sort of uh, flows, <laughs> you know, water, electricity, uh, the design of cities, like we're surrounded by design. Every child is surrounded by design, but is it's not part of the curriculum. It's not yeah. part of uh, education. And I think so many young people, and especially young girls, just think it's out of their reach. And it's a sort of mystery until they're maybe, I don't know, 15 or 16 and think, mm, you know, maybe I should start studying maths and sciences so maybe I can get into engineering. Like, I think the whole education and understanding of the relationship between, you know, well-being, uh, quality of life, how we feel in our everyday life, going from A to B, um, experience of schools, the spaces of schools, it's, it's everywhere, and yet we don't talk about it. It's not mm. part of the kind of public discourse. It's only sort of landmark projects or, you know, something that's celebrated at the end of the process rather than the beginning of the process. And speaking of process, I, in sort of related to what you said about sort of the limiting of sectors that architects can work in, which relates to procurement, the sort of dreaded word, I mean, the way projects are procured and the competitive system, whether it's local authority frameworks, the, the way it's, you know, the, the material you have to produce just to get on a framework is yeah. unbelievable. And it excludes so many young practices. It excludes so many female-led mm -hmm. practices because you don't have the project that has the you know, proves that you have the experience, you don't, maybe not, uh, don't have the turnover, maybe you don't have the staff. You know, it's great to offer responsibility and opportunity to young people, but, you know, when you fill out these RFQs, you have to show everybody has relevant experience. And I, I mean, it's, it's becoming so restrictive. And I think also the, um, competitions that are unpaid, RFQs that are unpaid, or the, or the honorarium is a tiny fraction of the cost yeah. to, to win the project. So yeah, that's a huge thing that should change. The RBA should be supporting that, you know, sort of setting a limit on what architects can be expected to do to um, pursue new projects. And it's a system, I think, in Europe that's adhered to very strictly yeah. to limit the amount of unpaid work architects do when they're bidding for jobs and also in North America. So, you know, these things you sort of think, oh, um, yes, but that's, that's, how, that's how it works. But I think when we speak about the, the profession as being not exemplary in terms of, you know, everybody being getting rich, you know, it's not going to be a place where you get rich. You know, we want to pay our staff well, we want to uplift the whole profession, make it a good profession for everybody to join. But the whole procurement system and the um, effort and cost of winning work is so high, it, I think it, it keeps, you know, that's limiting that's everyone mm -hmm. and, and making it a sort of exclusive um, endeavor and i'm just starting to think about the you know the the library of incredible information that go that, that you've researched for a particular competition both of you now in terms of your studios and then it just sits on a shelf and okay yes you're saying you don't completely start again on an, on another project but then again there's a certain amount of information that just sits over there and is waiting for a new home it's waiting for an opportunity I mean, it, it is r d like yes. all, all of those it competitions is, yeah. we do it is R&D <laughs> and you do learn lessons and you do skill up sometimes and you do have a portfolio piece yeah. which shows that you have gone through a process but I mean it's it's um, so uh, 
onerous the the mm -hmm. effort that has to be made and in a way the the fact that those competitions aren't you know in the UK it's ten thousand pounds you might get for an RBA competition yeah. to master plan a big piece of university campus and all the buildings in it mm -hmm. and in North America the sort of minimum is sort of a hundred thousand dollars if you do a competition mm -hmm. and it, if you're shortlisted so the discrepancy is kind of outrageous yeah. and I think that culture has to change we need to value design and we have to and value architecture and value the contribution that all design professionals make to quality of life and start that from a very young age. And I think at, at every scale, I mean, I'm very familiar with the process in, in Europe and in, in France, but uh, for competition and building new work and that system applies, of course, for the Grand Projet and the museums and, uh, and the master plans and so on, but also the exact same sort of rules apply to, um, to if a city wants to build a new public square uh, and, uh, and the construction cost is you know, just a few thousand. There's, there's still the same uh, procurement route which is reward, I mean, which is paid through uh, a sort of grid level which just allows uh, maybe a bit more younger practice, more upcoming uh, to, to, to be able equity. to build. Yeah. It's like uh, yeah. an equitable process and it's sort of ironic because everybody's talking about equity and <laughs> <laughs> institutions <laughs> and, you know, corporations, but how do we make the procurement of architecture equitable and um, more inclusive? And it's more profitable, yes, across the board. So thank you for coming and thank you to our panelists, incredible and that you've thank sh you. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go and have another drink. <laughs>